and <clears throat> welcome to another Florida Friendly Landscaping Educational Program uh, today on uh, this beautiful Wednesday. Um, I have Dr. Bill Lester with me again because we are continuing a series. Good morning, Bill. Um, Florida Gardening Mythology. We did one last week on general gardening myth mythology. So if you missed that one, you can find it on my Facebook page, the recording of it. And you can also go to Hernando County Government YouTube and find it there. If you have a friend, uh, your mom, somebody like that who says, I don't do the Facebook, they, many of them um, don't have a problem watching YouTube. And also the good thing about YouTube is that's where you'll get the subtitles. So, um, or the closed caption. So great way to go to Hernando County Government YouTube, look for Florida Friendly Landscaping's playlist. You can fall down a rabbit hole like crazy and learn everything Florida friendly. And also there's even a University of Florida IFAS extension playlist um, as well. So uh, good morning, Dr. Bill and welcome. Good morning. Let's get started. Here are our email addresses. If you'd like to speak to us, um, have questions for us, if you'd like a PDF of this program, I know um, last week at least one of you asked for the PDF of the program. Where that also becomes helpful is when I list resources so that you have it um, right in front of you, you know, because I go through a lot of resources to put these programs together. So then you can find out where I got the information and also then further expand your own knowledge. So here are our emails. I am Lily B, L-I-L-L-Y-B at HernandoCounty.us and um, Dr. Lester has a nice short email. He complains about my long email, although all he has to do is write L on his computer now and he doesn't have much effort. It comes up automatically. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Lester's email is wlester at ufl.edu. All right, today we're concentrating in our myth busting solely on lawns, because there's a lot of myths about lawns out there. And uh, Dr. Lester and I see a lot of things on Facebook or other forums. People go to the the wrong places to ask questions. If you go to your county extension office um, or you look up your land grant university's information, you are, well, you know, you have a much higher percentage of finding the correct information than if you ask your neighborhood Facebook group or if you ask your neighbor next door or if you ask your barber. Um, so, you know, go to the people who know turf and more importantly, who aren't selling you anything. Your land grant university, you know, is not, doesn't get any money by promoting anything. It's all research based, um, you know, information. So here's something um, we hear a lot, and this can go either way the mixing and matching of different grass types, because people think grass is grass, all grass is the same. Or you came from up north and it's not an effort to grow grass up north. It just kind of happens, doesn't it, Dr. Lester? Yes, yeah, something's going to pop up and grow. Right. And um, that kind of will also give you a hint that, you know, it's not all that natural <laughs> of a thing to grow here. There's no native lawn grass. We have plenty of native grasses, but no native meadow type ground cover grass. Therefore, Everything has been borrowed from somewhere else or kind of, you know, created <laughs> to make these long grasses. That's why, you know, don't be so hard on yourself if you find it difficult. But so you have these bare patches in your yard and you see on TV, you know, oh, buy this, this, this bag of seed and it'll just fill in your bare spots for you. Well, that's not going to work here in Florida, is it, Dr. Lester? Yes and no, and I'll explain that on the next slide. Okay. 
Also, um, we are kind of trained to believe that weed and feed products are the answer to everything. And we're going to move to the next slide. So, um, well, maybe the one after this. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Lester can explain it to you. But here are uh, the common, most common lawns you'll find in Hernando County. You're not going to find the same lawn that you had up north. I think I've said this recently, I was up north uh, the end of January and um, you know, one day was walking through two feet of snow very carefully to get to, to my sister's porch. And then there was a 40 degree day or a couple of days. So you know, I was able to walk across her grass much easier to get to her porch, but the grass was green. You know, why was the grass green? under the snow when our grass here turns brown as soon as it's cold. I'll let Dr. Esther explain that too, but the kind of lawns you're most likely to run into in Hernando County, St. Augustine, Floritam. Some people don't realize Floritam is a variety of St. Augustine. There's more than one variety of St. Augustine, but the variety most common in all of Central Florida is Floritan. So we kind of use those terms interchangeably. Then there's Bahia. Bahia also has different varieties, Pensacola and Argentine. You want Argentine really for your lawn. Pensacola you'll find on the roadsides, uh, pastures, things like that. And how I keep that in my mind is a um, Argentine starts with A. And you want an A plus lawn. <laughs> That's kind of how I remember that. Um, and then what Dr. Lester has and what I have, and they have coined a term for it. We haven't coined this term. It's called a freedom lawn. It's like it's probably it started out as Bahia lawns and lots of other native weeds have crowded in. And uh, do you care, Dr. Lester? No, it doesn't bother me. I'm good with it. And I don't care either, but you might be in a situation where you're forced to care. So, all right. So a lot of people who move here from up north, up north, you probably had something like uh, Kentucky bluegrass or a type of fescue or maybe a type of ryegrass that you had for a lawn up there. And those things will all grow here during the winter for a few months. When it warms up in the spring, usually by March or April, they will die because it's too hot down here. So in Florida, we have uh, warm season grasses for turf grass. And here in central Florida, like Lily said, the most common ones are different varieties of St. Augustine. There's about a dozen different varieties of St. Augustine or Bahia grass. And there's two varieties of it, the um, Pensacola and the Argentine. Some people have Zoysia. Zoysia can be a beautiful lawn, but boy, it's a lot of work and it's, it can die on you very easily. So I, I personally wouldn't recommend switching to Zoysia unless you want to put a lot of work and money into it. Zoysia is very um, popular in the villages. Yeah, it is popular in some areas, but it is a lot. You have to know what you're doing with it because if you make mistakes, it's not forgiving. Mm -hmm. And you can grow Bermuda. Bermuda is the type of grass that they grow at golf courses, especially on the putting greens. You can cut it, oh my gosh, like a quarter inch short. But for a lawn, it's difficult because every time you cut it, the top turns brown. Most people don't find it very attractive. So the two main ones are St. Augustine and Bahia grass, and they're warm season turf grasses, and they are very, very different from what you probably grew and are more familiar with up north. They look different. Warm season grasses grow really well when it's warm down here. During the winter, they go dormant, they stop growing, they turn tan, they turn brown. They don't do a whole lot for a few months. In the spring, they perk up and grow again. Just apples and oranges, basically, between up north and down here, the types of grass that we grow. And let's get back into trying to mix, unless you know, you're looking at this freedom lawn situation, but if you are trying to grow one specific kind of lawn, mixing and matching can be problematic. Yes, because if you think, well, I'm going to mix half Bahia grass and half St. Augustine, they both get cut at different heights. They get fertilized differently. 
they have different irrigation requirements and the weed killers that you use on one will kill the other. So yeah. if you have the two of them mixed, that's okay. But just keep in mind that there's, they are different grasses. And if you want to go and use some kind of weed killer on a mixed half St. Augustine, half Bahia grass lawn, there's really nothing that you can use that's not going to kill half your lawn. My lawn is, like I said, it is Bahia. Um, this beautiful frog fruit, which we're seeing here. Uh, I have to say it. Yes. Um, got some portulaca coming in, which we'll see that later. Um, Black medic, which we'll see that later. These are all weeds that I'm mentioning. Crabgrass, lots of crabgrass. But since I don't put any chemicals on my lawn, basically just mow it and let it rain on it. That's a different situation than some of you might be dealing with who live in HOAs. Okay, here's the most important thing you're gonna to hear today. So um, as a you know, elementary teacher would say, that put on your listening ears now, especially for these next couple of slides. So the myth of how low can you mow? Dr. Lester mentioned some Bermuda grasses can be mowed very low, but when we are discussing Bahia and especially Floritan, people think mowing lower is better because they want that look. They wanna look like a golf course. And they also think they won't have to mow as often or they won't have to have their lawn uh, company come as often. So Dr. Lester, what do we say about that? As a general rule, and as for both St. Augustine and Bahia grass, but even more so for St. Augustine, if you consistently cut it too short, that is the quickest surefire way to kill your lawn. It can, if you cut it way too short, you can kill it in as little as one to two years. And a lot of people who contact us and they have a dead lawn, they're thinking, oh, well, it's because I didn't water it enough or I didn't fertilize enough or I didn't spray for chinch bugs or this or that. Nope, you can kill it just by cutting it too short. So for Bahia grass, you need to cut it ideally three inches high, three to three and a half inches. For St. Augustine, you want to cut it four inches high. Sometimes people will have lawnmowers that even on the highest setting, it's not very high. You'll have to choose between buying a new lawnmower or buying a new lawn then. So. Wow. Can you get bigger wheels? Will that help? Kind of you can, you can a try. Bit? You yeah. can try because I know that there are some <laughs> homeowner model riding lawnmowers where even on the highest setting, it's still pretty, it's still maybe three inches high. And if you had a Bahia lawn, it's not ideal, but it's not all that bad. For St. Augustine, you got to cut it four inches high. If you have a service cutting your St. Augustine, they're probably cutting it shorter than that. You need to go outside with the ruler after they cut it and check because cutting your grass too short is very, very stressful on it. And you will start to have disease outbreaks and it will kill your lawn. So why, why, why is it so important? What does having a higher lawn um, do for our lawns? It does a couple different things. It's much less stressful on the grass. It gives the grass, especially St. Augustine, more blade surface for photosynthesis. Taller grass shades out a lot of the really, really low growing weeds. We see people if they, especially with the Bahia lawn, if they start cutting it really, really short, all they end up with is the really, really low growing weeds, things like dollar weed, mm -hmm. crabgrass, a couple of others. And you end up, I had a question just yesterday and the lady sent us some pictures. I shared them with Lily. She thought she had a Bahia lawn and we looked at the pictures and it's like, I don't see any Bahia there. All I see is 100% really short cut weeds. Because mm -hmm. weeds, you can cut really, really short and certain ones that won't kill them. They really like it. But with turf grass, if you cut it too short, you will kill it. And I have the advantage of um, working for the water department. So I was able to um, ascertain that um, they've been regularly watering these weeds as well. 
Yeah. <laughs> and you don't need to water the weeds. Trust me, weeds have a way of getting by on their own with very, very little water. It's the turf grass that is, might need regular irrigation during dry parts of the year. Weeds, you don't have to water. Right. And especially, you know, when he mentioned the St. Augustine grass, it grows on runners. And the runners have these nodes, these growth nodes. You mow too low, you know, especially if you want to get really low, you are breaking apart those, cutting into the, where their growth nodes, you know, where they're going to grow. And, and yeah, if you it, cut it too low and the runners are exposed, they'll burn up in the sun in really sunny weather during the summer. Mm -hmm. And this is, we preach this all the time, but it is really the key. And the good thing about it is it's so easy to fix. Just <laughs> stop mowing mm -hmm. as much, you know, mow higher. This one isn't really high enough. <laughs> it needs to be up to that three and a half or four. Mm -hmm. Ideally so, four for St. Augustine. Yeah, and this is St. Augustine. You can tell by the wider blades. Mm -hmm. So this one isn't you know, isn't high enough. So, you know, um, as he said, try to get your mower up as high as it'll go. Where they do have zoysia grass growing, um, we've talked to water friendly agents in Sumter County and the villages in Lake County. They have the opposite problem. They can't get people to mow the zoysia grass low enough to make it thrive. But our St. Augustine, Floritam, and Bahia, you gotta mow them high. And They're try all not different. They all have different recommended cutting heights. Yes. Then speaking of mowing, the myth is that uh, you got to bag up your grass clippings and pay to throw them away out at the curb because they cause thatch. Is that true? Generally, no. If people have thatch problems, um, that's normally caused by them watering too much and fertilizing too much, which stimulates the grass to grow too rapidly and it becomes really, really thick. And then you start to have a thatch problem. Because if you've you created a hydroponic lawn, lawn. And you, yes. You cut your lawn on a regular basis and cut just a small amount off. They recommend no more than one third of the grass blade. So cut it frequently so the little grass clippings are short. And here in Florida, they're going to break down and decompose very, very quickly on your lawn. Mm -hmm. And and the University of Florida has, you know, stated if you do that, there's enough nitrogen in those little blades, even though they're 98% water. You know, they're going to break down that quickly when you chop them up like that. That you can um, skip one of your fertilizations a year because you are fertilizing by returning um, the grass clippings back to the soil. We call that grass cycling. If you don't want to do it that way, you know, then find some other use for them. I know Dr. Lester likes to put them in his compost bin. Yes. Mm -hmm. They stay on the property. They get used. Yes. It really makes no sense if you think about it. You're growing a crop. And usually somebody who grows a crop, they grow it to make a profit. So you're paying to grow it. You're paying to water it. You're, you're paying to cut it. So then one would assume, well, you want to do something with that crop after you've gone through that. No, you're going to pay to throw it away, <laughs> you know, <laughs> at least utilize it, you know, back in the yard that pay you back a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, this is where I have to come in because uh, I am with the water department here in Hernando County. And I've been taking walks lately since the time changed. Um, did it once or twice and my little tiny doglets now believe it is a rule of the universe. So they will not leave me alone after dinner. So we're going for walks. So then, you know, so I'm seeing things I maybe not wanted to see with people's watering habits in my neighborhood. Here are your watering days here in Hernando County and where I live, we all have wells and guess what? We're on the same watering restrictions in Hernando County, as everyone else, even though we have a well. We have lots of programs about that. One pretty short one we did um, called My my Well, Our Water. Yes, it's your well, but it's our water. Nobody has water rights here in Hernando County. It, you know, you don't have a wall 
walling in your water around your property. That's not how it works here. The water belongs to everyone and no one. And we've got to, we've got to share it. We've got more and more and more people coming in. So these are, you're, we're under one day a week watering here in Hernando County. Here's another myth. Um, I can, I'll just throw in here. I got a phone call. You know, I'm very thankful they called and checked because they were, they were skeptical for a good reason. But their, oh, was their irrigation contractor came in to fix up their irrigation system, told them, oh yeah, on um, March 12th, which is when the time changed, we're going back to two days a week. <laughs> what? Well, they told me. Yeah. And I had to do really do some research and find out, well, yeah, and um, if you're in the St. John's Water Management District, that was true. Um, not here in Hernando County. So, and these, these one day a week watering restrictions, they're not going to change. So that's something you can, you know, you don't have to worry about, is it going to change? This is how it is <laughs> right here. And I don't, you know, I tell people it's not going to um, get less strict. It's just not, you know, not with our resources that we have right now. So this is the way that we can share the water for now. Dr. Lester doesn't water his lawn. Nope. I don't water my lawn. But, you know, for those who do, you know, code enforcement, uh, if they catch you watering on the wrong day, you will be cited. So, and I know they're going to be ramping up those um, efforts. So for those, you know, or you, I'm sure it's not you guys, but you know, your neighbors or whatever who are trying to find the loopholes and stuff, they are working on hiring more people to work more hours <laughs> and uh, get a hold of that. So here is another myth speaking along the same lines. Well, and I hear this all the time. The county will only let me one water one day a week. And that killed my lawn. My lawn died of thirst. Look at this poor, terrible lawn, <laughs> Dr. List. It looks like we were discussing it beforehand. It looks like a flamethrower went through this lawn. So is your lawn going to die of thirst on one day a week watering, Dr. Lester? Generally, no. Because as we're going to get to, Keep in mind that it rains here in Florida also. So lawns get more than just your irrigation, they get the rainfall too. Now we do have dry times a year here in Florida. So we, we're not gonna get nearly as much rain, but if you irrigate your lawn correctly and for the right amount of time, once a week, it'll get by until the rains return and it starts to rain again. And then on the other side, during the rainy times of year, during June, July, and August, July and August especially, it'll rain every other day. And when we're getting a lot of rain, you don't need to irrigate on top of that. So you need to make sure that you have a properly operating rain shut off, or you go in and adjust your timer, or just shut the system off and figure, okay, when it gets dry again, I'll go out there and on my day to water, I'll throw the switch and run it if needed. The last house we lived in, that's how I did it. I never had it on the timer. I manually run it. I only ran it maybe 10 times a year, tops, probably less than that. So um, then the question we always get is, how long should we put each zone you know, to run? That depends. There is no one answer because it depends on the spray heads you have, whether it's a little pop-up one like you see in the bottom of the picture here, one of the large rotor um, spray heads, the rotors put out a lot more water, but they cover a huge area. So they have to run for longer. Little pop-up sprayers cover a small area, and it doesn't seem like they're putting out a lot of water, but it just stays in that one area, and they run for a shorter period of time. So to get your timing down, you need to go out there and test your system and go through zone one, zone two, zone three, however many you have, and set little cat food cans, tuna fish cans, um, short dog food containers. If you have that many rain gauges, you could use them. They work the best. And set them around the lawn and run the system. 
and then go out with the ruler and measure how much water it put down in the amount of time that it ran for. You should water anywhere from a half to three quarters of an inch, generally three quarters of an inch each time you water. So when you measure it, you can see if it put down too much water, in which case you want to shorten the time, or too little water, you need to turn the time up a little bit, and that way you can fine tune it. Because everybody's system and zones and spray heads are all completely different. There is no, I, I can't tell you, run it for an hour, run it for 40 minutes, run it for three hours. They're all different. So that's how we find out. We do this, this very simple test mm -hmm. to see how long it's going to. And we, we did this on Monday. We had to visit um, a neighborhood here in Hernando County. And they were uh, asked us to come out there and check their irrigation system. So myself and Lily's boss from Hernando County Utilities and Yi Lin, uh, who's one of our water specialists from University of Florida, went out there and we did exactly this. We tested mm -hmm. random zones and we put out little containers, ran it for 15 minutes, saw how long they normally had a set for, did the math and figured out how much water they're putting down each time they run their sprinklers. Yep. So even we do this. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to go along on that field trip, but that's fine because I was putting this <laughs> presentation together. It was a beautiful day out. We couldn't have asked uh, for a nicer day to be out there stomping around yards and playing in sprinklers. The hay or grass, how much uh, irrigation does it need? Less. Bahia grass has much lower water requirements than St. Augustine. Bahia can technically get by with no extra irrigation. If you do want to irrigate it, it doesn't need much. It goes hard dormant in the winter and extra watering doesn't help it really at all. Summer, if we're getting any kind of regular rain at all, that's more than enough for Bahia. Mm -hmm. You could irrigate a little bit in the spring and fall during a dry spell, but Bahia if it gets too dry, it goes tan <clears throat> and dormant. And as soon as it rains, it you can literally look out the window and watch it turn green and start to grow. Yeah. It'll get crunchy and you will swear I've killed it this time and it'll pop right back with the rain. It's happened to me a bunch of times before where you think, oh my gosh, my lawn is dead. As soon as it rains, by the next morning, it's green and growing and usually needs to be cut again. So yeah. Okay. And you've touched on this, this myth. Um, you moved to Florida and you've been led to believe an irrigation system is a, a must. You must have it for your lawn or your lawn's not going to survive. It is, you know, your lawn's uh, life support system. And, and so you must run it at every allowable time. You know, I showed you our watering restrictions, and there are lots of people who do follow those, but they keep their irrigation clocks set for that and never take it off. You know, even if it was, it's just rained, if they don't have a working rain <clears throat> sensor, or, you know, they, they just won't skip that time, no matter what. So, what do we have to say about that? Like I mentioned earlier, the irrigation is supplemental. So it's kind of as needed on top of natural rainfall. Uh, it's required by law that everybody, uh, if they have an outdoor irrigation system, that they have a working rain sensor. And there's a lot of different sensors on the market now. They're, the technology with that is amazing. They have Bluetooth ones, they have Wi-Fi ones, they have all kinds of things on the market but you have to have at least that little sensor that if you go outside, it's usually above where your irrigation timer box is and it hangs off the edge of the roof. And what that does is if it rains or if it's raining and the water piles up inside of that little tiny plastic contraption, then it shuts the system off. And number one, it stops your irrigation from running when it's pouring rain obviously you don't need it then and if it's just rained it'll shut it off for the time being until the little unit dries out and turns the system back on or you could do like i did and not even depend on the timer just go ahead and turn it all off learn where the switch is and how to turn it on 
And then when I wanted to run it, I knew what day it was. I think Wednesday was my day when we lived in our last house. And you couldn't do it until after 5 or 6 p.m. 6. 6. So I go out there in the evening, throw the switch, and it would run through the whole cycle and shut itself off and boom, water, no problem. But mm -hmm. I made the decision when to water, not the, the timer box or um, the neighborhood or anybody else. And we are planning a um, class that'll be coming up the end of May, I think is when we I think so, plan yes. that, um, all about your irrigation system. So we'll get into a lot more details there too. And if you have, um, if you don't think your uh, rain sensor is working, probably isn't, go out and look, you know, right after this, it might be upside down or sideways, but also they really only have what, a three or four year lifespan you know, reliably. Sure. Um, the neighborhood that we checked, they had one rain sensor that was completely broken and it was only about a year old. Mm. So they can last as little, the little inexpensive ones. And it, I think inexpensive by that, I mean like $20, $25. Uh, they can last for as little as one year. They can last many years, but they usually don't. Usually after three years, most of them are not functioning anymore. And if you are Hernando County Utilities customer, you got an insert in your bill. So go find that, take it out of the recycling bin and, and go find that. And um, you'll find information about a rebate that you may qualify for. There are you know, qualifying factors um, to get if you get a rain sensor. So you know, look into that. And by rebate, we mean a credit you know, on your water bill. If your house is older than 2010 and um, you get a rain sensor, you have to utilize one of our participating irrigation contractors, and then you'll get a uh, $55 credit on your water bill. So that's worth looking into, or you can email me and I'll be glad to send you the information. Let's move from watering now to pest control. And if you have a St. Augustine lawn, it's just programmed now in our brains. There's one of those little creases in our brains that have been put there that says you have a chinch bug problem. And the, the, the history of Floritam lawns and why it's named that is because researchers from the University of Florida and Texas A&M got together to you know, create a chinch bug resistant lawn in 1973. Hence its name, Laura Tam, University of Florida, Texas A&M. Now you know something you didn't know before. And, and that chinch bug resistance worked probably till, you know, 1978, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, you know, it doesn't take and, long. Right. And so then we associate St. Augustine lawns with chinch bugs. And so we think, you know, if our lawn looks bad, maybe that problem we saw earlier that scorched lawn, maybe it wasn't watering, maybe it was chinch bugs. This is how people's thought processes are gonna go. So you have to stay ahead of them with preventative treatments. Here is that same lawn. I'll let Dr. Lester take over from here. Well, we do have chinch bugs here in Hernando County and in Central Florida. And chinch bugs are a pest of St. Augustine turf grass. I don't think there's any resistant varieties now. So out of all the different varieties, they can be fed on by chinch bugs. And chinch bugs can be a very serious pest, but don't assume that every dead spot in your lawn is caused by chinch bugs because probably nine times out of 10, it's not. Here in Hernando County, we very rarely see chinch bugs. Although if we to... went out in let's say July or August or September and checked 10 lawns, we would probably find at least eight chinch bug or two or three or a couple at each lawn. You have to go out there and actually look for them and scout for them and there's ways to do that. But the um, action threshold for chinch bugs is I believe an average of 20 per square foot. Yeah. At that point you should treat. Before that, it's not recommended you treat. 
if you have a dead spot in your lawn, you need to go out there, either you or your pest control service, look long and hard to find out what the real problem is. If it's chinch bugs, you might need to spray for them. If it's something like uh, a fungal disease take all root rot, that insecticide for chinch bugs doesn't do a bit of good. The fungus is going to keep going and it's going to keep killing your lawn. There's other things you do to cure that problem. So the biggest mistake that services and homeowners make is just assuming that every dead spot is chinch bugs. Like I said, nine times out of 10, it's not. And preventative spraying for chinch bugs, if you don't have them, accomplishes nothing other than putting more pesticides out in the environment. <coughs> So, so like, if you think that you do have take all root rot or you do have a dead spot in your lawn, you can bring a sample to our office. The best day of the week to do that is Thursday because we definitely have somebody there then. I'm in and out all the time. I'm not there right now. So <laughs> good example of I'm all over the place. Um, yes, you are all over the place. <laughs> yes, I am. But if you dig up about a one square foot sample of your lawn, we don't need the dirt. There's nothing that we can look for inside of the dirt. The dirt has a million bacteria, different species of bacteria, and a million different species of fungus. We can't figure out anything from it. We do need to see the grass and the roots and pick a spot at the edge of a dead spot so that half of your sample is green and half of it is dead. Because if you have a disease, you know where the disease is? Right in the middle, right at that very, very edge. So if you bring in, uh, tw and people do this, they bring in 20 dead blades of grass. We can't tell much from that. You can if tell you bring it's dead. In something from the perfectly healthy part, well, it's still healthy. There's nothing we can find there either. So bring in half dead, half alive, about one square foot, not too much dirt because we don't need the dirt. And we can look at it under the microscope. And if it is take all root rot, we could tell right away with a microscope. And then you will give a treatment plan. Yes. What, then we can what tell is you yeah. what to do to help avoid that? What is take all root rot? It sounds pretty uh, scary. Uh, technically, is Guamanomyces graminus graminus? So that's the scientific. Oh, thank you. That was very helpful. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> uh, special word for today. Um, yes. <laughs> it's a fungus that lives in the soil and it affects um, St. Augustine grass. There's a slightly different type that affects wheat. We don't grow wheat here in Florida. There's a problem way out west. Um, <clears throat> what it does is it attacks the roots and it attacks the runners on St. Augustine grass and kills them. And it can spread and spread and spread. And go from a little spot to a big spot to a really big spot and kill your entire lawn. What happens is this fungus never really goes away. <clears throat> there are things that you can do to help minimize it, but the most important thing you could do is try to manage your lawn so it's not stressed. Stressed St. Augustine lawns get take all really bad and completely die. So if you're wondering, okay, well, what's really stressful on my lawn? Go all the way back to the beginning. Cutting it too short is probably the most stressful thing you could do to your lawn. If you have take all in your neighborhood or in your lawn and you cut the grass too short, you will have a huge outbreak of take all root rot and it will kill your lawn. And you'll contact us and say, should I water? Should I fertilize? And we'll go, nope, it's not going to help any. You cut it too short and you got take all and it died. We see this happen a lot in the Spring Hill area because just naturally very, very sandy soil. So cutting too short, overwatering or over fertilizing all favors take all root rot and really helps it out. And you're going to have a huge outbreak. And then you're going to end up with many times a dead lawn is going to be the end result. There's a few other things that you could do. And if you have this issue, we can give you a really good fact sheet. And there are fungicides that help other things that you could do to help but management is, is really the key. There is no magic spray to make it all go away. And one thing you can do is if you have to switch lawns and you are allowed a different variety of lawn, 
pay along will get to take all we want, but will not be doesn't succumb to it, you know. Yes, Bahia technically gets take all, although I've never seen it on Bahia. It does not suffer or get any symptoms if it does have take all in the soil and you switch to Bahia. Okay. And here's the other thing, uh, the insect myth, you know, that insects, all insects are, are wanted. They're dead. They are wanted, not dead or alive, dead. You kill them all because all insects are bad insects. This I brought back from several years ago. My one and only attempt at, uh, you know, drawing for my profession, and you can see why I don't use it that much. <laughs> but here's our, uh, or you know, villain insect. If there are people out there who truly think the only insect is a dead insect, what do we have to say about that? Well. Technically, 99% of all different insect species are either beneficial or not harmful. Only 1% of species are actual pests. And just recently, we've gotten a number of phone calls and emails with pictures. People don't make the mistake of <clears throat> you walk outside and you see something wrong with your lawn and you look around and if you see an insect, it's like, ah, that's, that must be my problem. It almost never is. Got um, some pictures the other day of somebody who said they had grass and it all died. And the pictures they sent, the area was total complete dirt. It looked like they had just raked it and prepared it for sod. Mm -hmm. And it had another area where it was sodded. You could see the edge of the pieces of sod. And they say um, they found in the bare dirt area, they found beetles. Some species of scarab beetles, they make little holes, they make little piles of sand. They said, the beetles killed my lawn. It's like, well, no, you have no lawn because you have no lawn growing there. Mm -hmm. Something else might have killed what was growing there, but it's not scarab beetles. They've, I've never seen them. And I've asked services also, and nobody's ever seen scarab beetles get to a point where they actually start causing major damage to your lawn. The problem was they started, they tried to start a lawn from seed. They didn't water it enough. It was the wrong time of year, the wrong type. They tried Bermuda, which mm. you can start from seed. It's really, really difficult. And the seed didn't come up. So the beetles were not to blame. They made other mistakes that was the actual problem. So don't think that your problem is always insects or whatever insect you see in the yard, because it's usually not. Insects are important for lizards, frogs, birds, all kinds of different wildlife. Ladybugs are important for eating aphids on your hibiscus and your roses and other things. And thinking that you need to go out there and kill everything on your property to make it completely sterile to have a decent lawn and tree and bushes and roses is just not true. You can't sanitize the great outdoors. People will do that and they wonder, how come birds don't come to my bird feeder? I wouldn't if I was a bird. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, and they so... ask, what can I do to kill all the lizards? Why would you want to do that? They eat bugs right before they get into your house. I think mm -hmm. that's a good thing. Yes, yeah, that's the, I know that's one of your major annoyances. People ask you how to kill the lizards. It's like, don't live in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if one gets to one eye, get a broom and shoo them out, move them towards the back door and send them back out. I tried doing that the other night and he bit me. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. So I just left him. <laughs> the <laughs> lizards don't hurt anything. They're no, not going to damage no. anything. All they're, all they're looking for is bugs to eat. And I think that's a pretty good thing. And Bill knows I, I grew up here at least since I was 11. So he's asked me before, and I'm like, of course, yes, I had the lizard earring. I put the lizard up there. That's just a rite of passage. <laughs> um, but you know, also these 99, you know, percent that are beneficial or just hanging out, they are also fighting the pests. You mentioned the pests. What we consider pests are generally plant eaters, or some, or a pest like. Uh, jeopardize human health, you know, or um, 
commercial crops. That's gonna get you to be a, a pest. And what our allies are the carnivorous ones who are going to eat them. And we don't want to kill our allies with friendly fire. They're out there helping us. And even the ones not doing anything, what are they doing? They're providing meals for those lizards, frogs, birds, etc. So yes, as Bill always says, you can't sanitize the great outdoors, nor should you want to. Now let's talk about weeds. We've had people over the years, generally male people, but not always, <laughs> lose their minds regarding weeds. You know, they just, they, they retire and their whole focus gets on their lawn and their weeds or they're the weekend warrior. Um, is it possible to even have a weed-free lawn? Well, technically, yes. And it's you're going to see it more often with St. Augustine than with Bahia, just because of the growth habit. But you need to learn to tolerate at least a certain number of weeds out there because you'll get to a point where you're spending so much money and buying so many chemicals and applying so much that it's really not realistic. You might want to think about taking up a different hobby. Golf, I understand, is fun. I enjoy <laughs> fishing, vegetable gardening. So don't obsess over making sure your lawn is 100% weed free. If you have to maintain it pretty well because you live in a homeowners association with St. Augustine, you can get most of the way there. But hey, uh, you're always going to have some weeds. So much easier. Just take a deep breath and live with a few weeds. It, it'll be okay. It'll be all right. And they're, they're finding more and more um, through different research. And, you know, monocultures. What is a monoculture? That means, you know, miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of one crop. We have found nothing but trouble with monocultures. Kind of caused the Dust Bowl <laughs> in the 1930s because if you have all of the same crop, then a disease sweeps through and gets everything. You know, there's just, there's not enough food diversity for pollinators, all that. So bringing that back around to lawns, which is a huge monoculture in our country, across our country, if we let a little diversity, it's actually healthier for the lawn you know, to have, it's healthier for the soil that your lawn is in. You know, some of these weeds are legumes that help fix nitrogen, um, you know, and you're going to attract more pollinators. These are all native weeds that I actually have in my yard. This Florida betony, my portulaca is coming up, <laughs> the primrose, mm -hmm. um, I said this fog fruit, this fog fruit will attract three different types of tiny little butterflies. It's a great ground cover to have. And then this black medic comes up too. I don't know what the cell phone <laughs> this is a UF picture. Um, I guess it's showing size <laughs> or, you know, maybe cell phones are becoming invasive and growing in <laughs> lawns now, but I think it's showing um, the size of this black medic. And yes, it's yellow, but the seeds will become black. All of these are going to attract, you know, different pollinators. The Florida betony, is that rattlesnake weed. Some people actually um, eat the tubers of that. I don't know how to do that, so don't go out and start munching on your lawn. But so just so you don't feel as guilty or whatever that there's lots of weeds in your lawn, it's a growing movement. If you can, if you don't live in a really deed restricted area to have what we call freedom lawns that allows these weeds to coexist with our um, lawn grass. But also remember a healthy stand of grass as Bill kind of alluded to with St. Augustine, you mow it high enough, <laughs> it's gonna shade out a lot of these weeds. And, you know. Yeah, healthy, correctly managed grass is gonna be is going to outcompete many weeds. It's going to get the upper hand and push the other weeds out. And um, you're correct that with uh, cutting it high, it helps to shade out a lot of those really, really low growing weeds. Mm -hmm. So managing it correctly 
naturally results in fewer weeds to begin with. Mm -hmm. Oh, here's a there's one that a carryover from up north. Um, you need to sweeten your lawn with lime every year. So <laughs> let's get into that, Dr. Lester. Yeah, that is a northern thing. And soils, I mean, people use the terminology, you know, sweeten it with lime, or if it's acidic or very low pH, it's sour. I've never tasted soil in recent <laughs> years, so I really couldn't tell you if it tastes either way. But a lot of people up north would just, as a general rule, put down lime either in the fall or in the spring. You don't want to do that here unless you need to. You want to start with the soil test to tell you what your pH is. Have you ever run across anyone who needs to? You know, pretty rarely. We, Out of all the different soil tests that we do, because I get copies of the reports, and a lot of times people will call and I have to pull it up and explain what's going on to them. We very, I very rarely see acidic soil anymore in Hernando County. Out, I think, on the east side of the county, out in the woods, out in the country, mm -hmm. it could be acidic. But generally, most people in more suburban neighborhoods in Spring Hill and definitely along the coast have very high P, have fairly high pH to begin with. If you l put lime on it, you're going to end up with very high pH. And now you can't grow bahia grass because it needs slightly acidic soil. You'll, you can forget about growing azaleas or camellias or gardenias or blueberries because they all need acidic soil. Mm -hmm. So only apply um, lime if you've gotten the soil test done and the recommendations tell you to. Because the soil test will tell you how much to apply per 1,000 feet to get it right where it should be for what you're trying to grow. How do you get a soil test? You contact our office or shoot me an email. Uh, really, if you just call our office, then uh, you'll probably get a hold of Teresa on the phone. And if you stop by, we can give you the order form. We can give you a little paper bag. You can see one in the picture here. We can give you a little uh, instruction guide on how to take a soil test. And you would mail it up to Gainesville. They test it, send the results to you, and send the results to me also. And it's what, about $10 per sample? Yes, right now it's $10 a sample. Takes about a week or two. Takes closer to two weeks in the spring. They're busy. Okay. And you'll get a cop you'll get a copy of the same results they yep. do. So you can they then can call you and you can explain what it was <laughs> that they that they got. If they can exactly. Follow. If you look at it and you're not really sure what it's saying, just give me a call and I can explain it to you. Great. And speaking of the soil, the myth that fertilizer fixes everything. If my lawn looks bad, I need to add more fertilizer. And my lawn will die if it doesn't get fertilized frequently. And uh, more is better. So will your lawn die if you don't fertilize it, Dr. Lester? Generally, no. Um, Bahia grass if you don't fertilize it, it'll do generally just fine. St. Augustine does benefit from some fertilizer and University of Florida does have fact sheets and recommendations on how much to apply depending on what kind of grass you have and whether you live in North Florida, Central Florida or South Florida, because it's different. So they have fertilizer recommendations for everything. And if you look up that information, it tells you exactly how much you need per year, many services, boy, they're not shy with the fertilizer. They fertilize the heck out of lawns. And, and a lot of times you fertilize. Put down, you don't need to fertilize for a while because the sod yards where they grow the sod, they're not shy with fertilizer either. They pour it on. So you really don't need anywhere near as much fertilizer for your lawn as you may think that you do. Oh, the label, the label is the law. And it's not more is better. It's less, less is more. You'll, your lawn will be a lot better off if you unfer, under fertilize it than if you over fertilize it. Especially if you have that take all root rot in the soil, you're gonna fertilize that fungus. And make yes, it very and you should only fertilize when you have a good reason to do so. 
like yeah, my well, lawn is yellowing a little bit, it's not growing as rapidly, you should always be able to write down a logical reason why you're fertilizing. And because it's April 1st is not a good argument or good reason for fertilizing. Here in Hernando County, we do have a fertilizer ordinance. If you can't fertilize your lawn, homeowners can from January 1st to March 31st. So you still have time. If you look at the University of Florida publications on fertilizer, they will recommend to start fertilizing for the spring on March 15th. Two weeks isn't going to kill you. You know, it's not going to make that much difference if you do wait till April 1st. But as Bill said, why? You know, why you don't need to fertilize just because it's a certain time of the year. Here's the information about our fertilizer ordinance here in Hernando County. If you're in a different county. Many counties in Florida have some type of fertilizer ordinance. So get on your county's webpage if you can find that. A lot of the southern counties their ordinance takes place June, July, August because of the stormwater runoff. Um, we're always in talks, Dr. Lester is always in talks with the powers that be talking about changing this ordinance. But there's not going, it's not just like the watering ordinance, it's not going to get less strict. Yeah. What we're looking at is probably also having those summer months along with these three, <laughs> three months because you don't need to be fertilizing in the winter. There is no purpose in it. Just sends the fertilizer right down to our aquifer. That hasn't happened yet, so don't quote me on it, but this is the way it exists right now. Just know that there are talks of things changing. So that is all of our um, lawn myths right now. We were trying to cover a whole lot in an hour. And I'll, I'll wrap it up with um, one of our colleagues sayings, um, Jim Mall. he's in Pasco County. He's the master gardener coordinator in Pasco County. But what he always says about these things, and we kind of alluded to it, that if you start to see your lawn is looking a little unhappy, you decide, I got to water it more. I've got to put more on, more water on. Well, that didn't work. So it must need fertilized. And as I we kind of alluded to, well, but I should put more, more fertilizer on. Well, that didn't work. It must be an insect problem. So I'm going to get the pesticides and I'm going to put more of that on. And meanwhile, your lawn's going down and down and down and down, not getting any better, but because you know, all that you ever did was keep putting more on and more on and more on. And you can see where the the um, the end of his story is leading there. Remember, it's not my story, it's Jim Mall's story, but that this person also has never learned their less on, <laughs> to put less on. And you and I, we don't even put anything on our lawns, really. No, I mean, last- nothing. Last summer, for the first time in a long time, I um, put some Bahia seed around, kind of uh, reseeded, uh, you know, first time in like 15 years for this poor lawn. And um, when the rainy season started and gave it a little bit of um, black cow, really did help it, you know, that summer. But just the, you know, compost, mushroom compost, something like that, you know, that's all that we'll put on. But so, and we had this last week too. Where do you go to find, you know, the correct resources? Not some willy-nilly neighborhood Facebook group where everyone gets to just spout their opinion. You can handle the truth. And that can be found at um, really any land grant university across the United States. You put in a search, put EDU, except Florida is so unique. We're not a thing like Ohio. We're not a thing like Pennsylvania or Minnesota or Michigan. We're a little bit like Georgia. <laughs> you know, we're a little bit like Alabama, but still even those, South Florida really isn't like those places. Um, so be careful. You can try other land grant universities. Just remember how unique Florida is. That's why we always tell you to look up University of Florida um, based uh, information. 
IFAS is the Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences. That's the College of Agriculture at UF. They have so much information online where you can find this, you know, this out. And if you want to talk to somebody directly, call a master gardener, as Bill mentioned, Thursdays is a great time. You'll get to talk to Gurney. Gurney's really smart. Um, been a master gardener since 2005. They're every Thursday, except for maybe a year during COVID and, and he missed it. So he came back and um, there's their phone number 352-754-4433. Or if you're in a different county, find your county extension office. Every county has one. I think almost every county has master gardeners. Um, yes, everyone who, around here does. Yeah, and they'll be glad to help you out with that. Here are the resources that I used. As I said, if you email me and ask for a PDF, then you can get a list of all these great resources where I, you know, because I don't just make this stuff up off the top of my head. I make sure that I stay in line with what I'm teaching you. And here's upcoming classes and my timeline that Dr. Lester likes. Um, next week, Bill won't be here, but I will be. And I will be here because we're talking about be specific. What is that about? Flowers, plants that attract native bees in our area. That's going to be, I think, a lot of fun. I'm excited about researching that as well. And um, on the 6th, Dr. Lester will be back. He has a special program. It'll be mostly him um, talking about I spy something out of place. That's all about, well, you can tell them it's your program. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure, that's all about different resources for helping you to identify or report things that you might see in your yard or on your property or alongside of the road that look really out of place. Let's say you walk out in your backyard one morning, you have a four foot lizard sitting on the picnic table. Oh, yeah, I would spy that. <laughs> yes. now, we don't have any native four foot lizards that should be on your picnic table. So. If you're wondering, well, who, who do I call? What do I do? I, I got a phone, I'll take a picture. That's great. There's a lot of different web-based resources, things that you can use your phone for uh, to help you get them properly identified and reported if it is something like new or invasive, something they're tracking. So uh, I'll give you a hint right now. If you answer your phone and I'm calling you and I'm screaming, then there is a four foot lizard at my picnic table, just so you know. It could happen. And we have twice a month, I have rain barrel and compost bin workshops. So the way to find out about that, again, email me and I'll be glad to send you all the information. Um, on April 20th, Carmen Bruno, who's our recycling coordinator, and I will be um, celebrating Earth Day by talking about recycling. In He's got the inside recycling, I've got the outside recycling. Two classes, one in person at Spring Hill Library, one online, just like this one. Everything you wanted to know about your Florida lawn. We'll get even deeper into lawns, why we have them, <laughs> you know. Um, and there are choices not to have them as well. And, you know, we'll get into all about learning about Florida lawns. So, oh, and here's the most fun thing coming up. We're having an Earth Day celebration. If you are in or around the Hernando County area, come on out and join us on Saturday the 23rd. You might be coming up to Brooksville for the Blueberry Festival. So, you know, stop by and see us as well from 9 to noon at uh, Bill's Volunteer Master Gardener uh, Nursery. We're going to, uh, there will obviously be plants for sale, a native plant expert on hand. Bernie will be there at a, a booth answering questions. Teresa is going to have a kids craft table. And we're going to have two actual programs, one from a uh, master gardener who is a retired entomologist on pollinators from 10 to 1045. And we have a friend who's a great um, naturalist and photographer. He's going to be out there teaching macro photography, catching the flowers in the nursery, the insects, all of that. So bring your camera or your phone, whichever it is, she can work with that. And I think we're gonna have a good time with that, don't you, Bill? 
Yeah, that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of really good speakers. Mm -hmm. Hopefully beautiful weather. Should be. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so hopefully. Yeah, I can't tell that far in advance. No guarantees so, in Florida, but hopefully. Yeah. All right, here's our emails again. So if you have questions about anything that we said or would like a PDF, the PDF one, that goes to me. The really hard questions, that goes to Dr. Lester. And um, look at our Facebook pages because we will both be at Dr. Lester's virtual plant clinic tomorrow where you can um, ask us questions and try to stump us. Again, the really hard ones go to Dr. Lester. Thank you, everyone. And I will see you next week for Be Specific. Thank you and have a great Florida-friendly day. Thank you.